Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. Oh, Ripple's trending with World War III. That ain't good. Anyway, let me start this video off by saying I wanted to congratulate NotFinancialAdvice.Crypto here on Twitter. Uh, he posted this XRP video a couple of days ago. Uh, I shared it over there on Twitter. It's been getting a lot of great reception. I know it's been uh, retweeted out uh, quite a few times now, and uh, it has gotten over three quarters of a million views, guys. If you still have not seen this video here, basically it is RippleNet usage, partnerships, everything like that in a nutshell. So, you know, it's kind of a good shorthand uh, if you want to kind of describe why you're invested in XRP to somebody who might not know. And if you still haven't seen this video, I suggest you guys give it a watch. I will link it down in the description of this video. And the icing on the cake, it's also pissed off Max Kaiser. So that is also a good thing. Taking a look at the XRP price today, we have come down a little bit. It's trading uh, right now at 45.9, so just under 46 cents. And, um, you know, I mean, th this structure is not anything new, really. This is XRP on the daily. We did originally see that high of about 55.7. Now XRP is pulling back down. And, uh, you know, if you took a look at the blockchain backers uh, video that he did a couple of days ago, and even just understanding these types of structures, um, we are likely to come back down here in this range, 37 to 39-ish cents down in and around here before we really kind of take off. And, uh, you know, just to kind of show you guys uh, another another example of that, was right up here back in uh, April of 2021. You can see that structure when XRP popped, uh, pulled right back down, then came up, formed what was looking like a lower double top before it came back down. Uh, and then we got some reaccumulation down and around here before we move to the upside once again. Just get rid of that. If you guys take a look at that, you guys can see that is looking like what is playing out down here. We had that high top, the drop, and then we formed the first high. We were likely going to form that next high and then come right back down in this area here so you know this is likely going to be played out over the longer term into 2023 i think 2023 though is going to be a fantastic year for cryptocurrencies mostly because and this is a bit of a counterintuitive uh thought process here is that the rest of the market is going to be doing so poorly i think it is going to get into the mass psyche i, I feel like you know this these kinds of ideas were a little fringe a few years ago but it is now becoming more and more apparent that more quote unquote normies are waking up and more people are realizing, oh boy, this central bank digital currency thing, this is not, th this could be really bad for me. My money is losing value, you know, especially if these people are not rich people, my money is losing value. They're telling me to buy assets like uh, houses and artwork and gold and silver and all that jazz. But I mean, you gotta think to yourself, what if you cannot afford to dump your cash into a hard asset like a home or a, a property of some sort? Uh, or if you just can't afford to buy artwork, you know, th these are high price tag items. What are people going to do? Well, I mean, they might decide to buy gold and silver. I mean, gold is still fairly pricey. Silver is uh, not, not so bad. But what's that other asset, right, that people are going to be flocking to? And lots are suggesting that it's going to be cryptocurrency. And there's no real uh, barrier to entry to get into cryptocurrency. I mean, it's priced so that, or rather not even so much priced, it's structured so that anybody can get in, even if you wanted to get into Bitcoin. You don't actually have to buy a full Bitcoin. You can buy fractions of a Bitcoin. So you can get in with $20,000, you can get in with $20, you can get in with $200, it doesn't really matter. Bringing this up to Eggrag Crypto here, uh, saying XRP in October, usually October or October, uh, favors markets. If XRP is the W2 corrective, finishing the ABC, then XRP might start W3 after the 10th of October, then the W4 corrective and the W5 corrective. So he's putting a bit of a timeline on this. Uh, even in his timeline, it does have to retrace, as you guys can see down here, to about 38 cents before we start moving up. So expect that 38 cent level. Then it's upwards and onwards into 2023. Uh, we've also got this guy's from XRP Crypto Wolf. So social media activity has surged to a three month high when it comes to XRP. This also comes at a time, as we know, uh, when Ripple is in court with the SEC, that is no secret. According to data shared by cryptocurrency social intelligence platform Luna Crush, XRP has recently seen its social activity nearly rise 10% in a single day to reach a three-month high of $1.95 billion engagements to content shared by 9,420 social contributors. So Lunar Crush posting the stats here, we are noticing increased XRP social activity along with its price, 9.5% today up, XRP three month activity though, on price 50% up, social engagements is up 38% and social contributions up 8%. So a huge spike for XRP, of course, uh, you know, that initial price move 
uh, certainly did help in the month of September. And uh, I mean, we, we did get the SEC, um, not a verdict, but we did get some positive news coming out of the lawsuit. So that certainly helped things along. Now we just got to wait for this pattern to play out. Uh, it will likely come back down here to this level of support before we see it continue to move to the upside. Also, XRP trading volume has risen. This guy's coming from Michael Branch here, up over 500%. XRP trading volume suddenly rose more than 500% per coin market caps data. However, the price of XRP did not make any major moves, leading many traders to speculate. At the time of publication, XRP was changing hands at around 47 and a half cents, uh, and that's down about 1.74% in the last 24 hours. But these are all signs, really uh, positive signs, that there is more activity on the XRPL. We're just seeing the XRP uh, trading hands at an appropriate price for buyers and sellers at this moment in time. So greater volatility generally leads to higher trading volumes in any markets as seasoned traders buy and sell large quantities to capture profits. As you guys can see down here though, Alex Cobb, uh, did bring this up $26 billion, somebody preparing for a pump. So that was uh, the volume here, 24 hour volume from just yesterday. Likewise, the rise in XRP volume may have been caused by investors wanting to buy XRP at its current lows. Traders have probably been scurrying to take advantage of the opportunity presented by the recent XRP volatility. The total number of units traded between buyers and sellers or trading volume is, however, said by some observers to be an unreliable measure of investor positioning. So that's the thing with volume, right? It could be anything. Um, it could be even just transfers from one exchange to another to prepare an exchange for, you know, whatever, the ODL transactions that could be coming up. Um, so volume high, this is interesting, just comparing it to volumes that we've seen in the past. I'm thinking, you know, whenever volume is higher, this is never a bad thing. Of course, you know, we got to put this on the backdrop of what is happening around the world. This coming from James Melville here on Twitter. Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse are tanking more right now than the financial crisis in 2009. So many market indicators that we are heading towards a major financial crisis. So the purple line here, that's Credit Suisse Bank. And uh, the orange line here, that's Deutsche Bank. And I believe this is on the four day chart. You guys can see back in 2005, six and seven, we saw upward trend for these two banks. And then the financial crisis right in around here, the, la uh, the, the latter half of 2008 and early 2009, we did see a dip. Um, but now look at where we are today. Okay, 2001, 2002, a decrease. We know we're heading towards a major financial crisis. Uh, no person is above the law here. Uh, just pointing this out. Nah, this is simply months of Russian sanctions affecting Putin's oligarch money. So he's saying it's for another reason. No money, no money laundering. No money laundering, no Deutsche Bank. Well, it's tough for everyday Russians. The upside is it will reduce the number of oligarchs stealing from them. He goes one step further and says, no Deutsche Bank, no Donald Trump. Maybe he'll roll over and plead guilty. They'll give a country club jail and three squares. Well, that's his opinion. I mean, you know, a lot of these banks have been accused of money laundering and kind of giving these money launderers a free pass. And I'm not pointing at anybody in particular, but I know uh, Deutsche Bank has been guilty of it and HSBC is another one uh, that has been convicted and I believe even fined uh, billions of dollars for uh, helping launder money. This was years ago now. But anyway, kind of getting off the point, the fact is, look at these charts, forming a downward trend. I'm thinking nobody's going to argue with me that a financial crisis, whether we're in the middle of it or it's looming, that we are going to be affected by this. Vinco here, Crypto Vinco on Twitter posted this emergency Federal Reserve meeting announced on Monday. So he got this from the Fed's website. Government in the Sunshine meeting notice. Advanced notice of a meeting under expedited procedures. So Sounds like they are in a rush to expedite things. It is anticipated that the closed meeting of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System uh, on Monday at 11 a.m. will be held under expedited procedures as set forth in this section of the board's, uh, board's rules regarding public observation of meetings at the board's office, and then it gives the address, and by audiovisual conference, uh, the following items uh, of official board business are tentatively scheduled to be considered at that meeting. Of course, they're not gonna tell us what it is, uh, but under expedited procedures, Hmm. Meanwhile, Matthew L-I-N-Y bringing this to our attention. The ICC calls on G20 to take the risk of a global debt crisis off the table. Nothing to see here. Well, what's going on with this? Ahead of this week's G20 finance minister's meetings, ICC is calling on G20 leaders to avoid a global debt crisis by suspending debt payments for all countries in need. So this is kind of a, yeah, we've got an emergency, guys, so maybe we should be suspending debt payments. Governments in emerging uh, economies have very limited, if any, fiscal space. 
to support businesses and families in dealing with worrying inflation pressures prevailing in global food, agriculture, and energy markets. The wave of economic shocks caused by the war in Ukraine risks precipitating a widespread debt crisis in emerging markets, which could result in further disruption to global trade and supply chains. Let's note this, okay? War in Ukraine. I'm going to come back to that later on in the video. Now, they're saying here, and I mean, we've talked a little bit about this in the past, uh, supply chain. Ukraine, a big producer of grain as well, supporting Europe's farming industry. This is all very problematic for global supply chains. As a recent report from the United Nations Global Crisis Response Group makes clear, there is now an acute risk of severe hunger in many developing countries absent of action to ensure that governments have the physical space to provide appropriate social safety nets. In this worrying context, the ICC has issued an open letter on behalf of business urging finance, uh, financial ministers and central bank governors to use this week's G20 meeting to agree on three common sense interventions to take the risk of a global debt crisis off the table and most fundamentally ensure that all emerging markets have sufficient physical space to protect their citizens from the very real risks of hunger and hardship. And guys, let me read you these. Reinstate the G20's debt service suspension initiative for an initial one-year period through July 2023, ideally with broad eligibility criteria to offer debt service relief to all countries in need. Uh, and then there's establish a time-bound roadmap to agree on enhancements to the common framework for debt treatment. No later than G20 Leaders Summit in November of 2022, which coincidentally is uh, when they are supposed to initialize ISO 20022 with regards to uh, cross-border payments. Uh, agree to a new issuance of IMF special drawing rights, no less than 650 billion US dollars coupled with further pledges. So the writing is on the wall. G20 countries um, understanding that um, we've got to do something here, and now they're looking to suspend debt payments for countries in crisis. Well, b basically for all countries. Harkens back to this, does it not? This guy's coming from Ian Bins here. Do you remember when Godfrey Bloom said this back in 2013? I know I've showed this clip on this channel in the past, um, but just listen to this. This is from 2013, a stark warning. Keep in mind when you think about the Great Reset and digital currencies, what he said back in 2013. Uh, well, uh, Commissioner, um Mr. President, uh, I rise again, I'm afraid, to make the same old hoary speech that I've been making here for several years, and that is, it is my opinion that you do not really understand the concept of banking. All the banks are broke. Uh, Bank Santander, Deutsche Bank, Royal Bank of Scotland, they're all broke. And why are they broke? It isn't an act of God. It isn't some sort of tsunami. They're broke because we have a system called fractional reserve banking, which means that banks can lend money that they don't actually have. It's a criminal scandal, and it's been going on for too long. To add to that problem, you have moral hazard, a very significant moral hazard from the political sphere. And most of the problem starts in politics and central banks, which are part of the same political system. We have counterfeiting, sometimes called quantitative easing, but counterfeiting by any other name. The artificial printing of money, which if any ordinary person did, they'd go to prison for a very long time. And yet governments and central banks do it all the time. Central banks repress the amount of interest that rate, rates are, so we don't have the real cost of money. And yet we blame the real retail banks for manipulating LIBOR. The sheer effrontery of this is quite astonishing. It's central banks. It's central banks that manipulate interest rates, Commissioner. And plus, underneath all this, we talk loosely, in a rather cavalier fashion, do we not, about deposit guarantees. So when banks go broke through their own incompetence and chicanery, the taxpayer picks up the tab. It's theft from the taxpayer. And until we start sending bankers, and I include central bankers and politicians, to prison for this outrage, it will continue. And that is that. Chicanery. Chicanery! Great use of the word. So, I mean, basically projecting where we are today, I mean, now we're worse off than we were back in 2013, but even in 2013, we weren't in a great spot. Um, you know, ever since the financial collapse, a lot of pundits have been suggesting that, um, you know, the, the industry has just been trying to uh, prop up the banking sector. And uh, really, it was in trouble back in 2007, 2008, and probably even before that. The first inclination, though, was the uh, financial collapse in 07, 08. Um, and we've just been propping it up since then. So again, this was from 2013. 
But keep this in mind because I think it's all coming to a head. 2022, 2023, of course, you know, the Great Reset Initiative is also part of this. Uh, and I wanted to bring you this, guys, from Michael Branch, the Bank of International Settlements, okay, the BIS. On Tuesday, they announced a multi-jurisdiction CBDC pilot spearheaded by the BIS Innovation Hub. So a multi-jurisdictional CBDC. What do they say here? First of all, it has been successful. The project saw 164 transactions worth nearly $220 million in real value, cross-border payments, through a purpose-built multi-CBDC platform. Apart from the Central Bank of Hong Kong, China, Thailand, and the United Arab Emirates, 20 commercial banks also participated in the project, which lasted a little over a month. Over $12 million worth of official digital assets, or CBDCs, were issued by four participating central banks to test the platform, the BIS said in a post. Uh, here's a quote, guys. It took place from August 15th to September the 23rd on the Embridge Ledger, a custom-developed DLT platform. The 20 participating commercial banks used the platform to settle different kinds of payments for corporate customers, uh, focusing on cross-border trade. Over $12 million in value was issued on the platform, facilitating over 160 cross-border payments and FX transactions, totaling more than $22 million in value. Now, this was just one test pilot here uh, done by the BIS for a multi-CBDC cross-border payment. Um, we know interoperability is going to play a big part in this, and considering we know how many uh, central banks, for example, are already partnered with Ripple, it's looking like the rest of the world needs to find a solution uh, for that interoperability if, when, I'm, I'm going to say when, when Ripple or RippleNet and XRP become the standard for moving anything of value. It's not just going to be money, guys. It's going to be everything of value. Now, MUFG, here's an example of this. MUFG partners with DataChain to explore Progmat stablecoin interoperability. We know MUFG is one of the uh, Japanese consortium uh, banking partners that have committed to using RippleNet. They want its Progmat coin stablecoin platform to be usable by other banks on multiple DLT networks. So just an example of that interoperability uh, for a central bank digital currency. So it is partnered with Japanese blockchain interoperability chain data chain. Uh, MUFG initially developed Progmat in an enterprise blockchain network for tokenized securities, including bonds, equities, and other digital assets, but it additionally unveiled Progmat coin as a platform to create stable coins backed by segregated funds held in a trust uh, with the aim of other institutions also creating interchangeable stable coins. The bank recognizes that Progmat is not the only game in town, so it wants organizations to use Progmat coin to settle security token transactions on Progmat and other blockchain networks. So they're realizing, right? You know, all blockchains, interoperability is basically going to be the key. All blockchains need to talk to one another. They need to be able to communicate because this is going to be a global solution to a very, very global problem that is knocking on our door. And in this particular case, MUFG is using this uh, particular blockchain for this use case, but we know these guys and other Japanese banks uh, in other capacities of their work are utilizing RippleNet and by extension XRP to transfer value. I don't know if it's just uh, for cross-border payments at the moment and if they will expand. Of course, this is going to be a very large, complicated web of blockchains and cryptocurrencies. And so, you know, although uh, the powers that be are trying to streamline this thing, it's sounding like a lot of these companies are uh, doing their own thing. And this is why interoperability is going to be so important. So interesting news there. Also wanted to bring this up, okay? Now this was back from March, but I think now more than ever does it speak volumes. The Ukraine war could speed digital currency adoption. This coming from BlackRock CEO Larry Fink. And you can see Larry Fink here uh, speaking at the World Economic Forum. No coincidence that I wanted to point that out. Um, okay, so the war in Ukraine could accelerate the adoption of digital currency, according to the CEO of the largest asset manager. BlackRock CEO Larry Fink wrote in a shareholder letter published on Thursday that Russia's brutal attack on Ukraine has had and will continue to have a range of ramifications on the world. Now, remember, this was published March 24th, 2022. So the war, although brutal, I, I don't want to minimize war, was only a month in at this point in time. So for him to make these very precise um, assumptions to me is kind of interesting. Though several governments were already looking to play a more active role in digital currencies and define the regulatory framework under which they operate, Frink, Fink, sorry, not Frink, Fink said the war will prompt countries to reevaluate their currency dependencies. Now, I don't even think that currencies were in free fall at this moment in time. At least they're not doing as poorly as they are doing right now. Uh, fast forward to September, actually now it's October, 2022. 
Uh, a global digital payment system thoughtfully designed, okay, here's a quote from Larry Fink, can enhance the settlement of international transactions while reducing the risk of money laundering and corruption, he wrote. Digital currencies can also help bring down costs of cross-border payments, for example, when expatriate workers send earnings back to their families. Well, 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 what does that sound like? It sounds exactly like RippleNet, and it sounds exactly like what RippleNet has been doing for many, many years. Um, you know, we know this because we research Ripple and talk about Ripple every single day, or at least I do. You guys are watching videos on YouTube. Uh, I'm watching videos on YouTube. We're all learning every single day. So, you know, for us, this seems obvious, but the fact that he's saying this, the fact that he is describing RippleNet in this March 2022 article, something that almost seems like a prediction from the future, from the CEO of one of the biggest companies in the world, or at least holds some of the most assets around the world, also partnered with the World Economic Forum, I do not think is any coincidence, guys. Fink said that due to increased interest from clients, BlackRock is studying digital currencies, stablecoins, and the underlying technologies. U.S. government agencies are also researching various parts of crypto. So this is the context this is in, okay? They were still studying cryptocurrencies and stablecoins at this particular point in time. The BlackRock spokesperson declined to comment about future crypto-related products, of course, and services the company could look to offer. Let's not forget this was before, I believe this was before, yeah, this was certainly before the Coinbase announcement. Fink said in an interview with CNBC last October that he believes that there is a huge role for digitized currencies and noted that the firm was learning about blockchain in the crypto sectors. He said at the time, however, that he is probably more in the Jamie Dimon camp. Okay, sure. Yeah, like they did not know that all this was going to transpire with this war in the Ukraine. Okay, so putting things into context here, World Economic Forum partnered with Ripple. BlackRock even decided to hire a Ripple employee, one of the guys who actually created the XRP calculator, uh, to work for them. I believe it was uh, Stephen Michnik, or somebody Michnik. I think it's Stephen Michnik. So there are certainly some connections here, and almost sounding as though Larry Fink is projecting perhaps prophesizing a little bit, considering he has the ear of the powers that be. Also, just kind of tying this all together, guys, I wanted to bring you this uh, video clip from Chainsaw Jackson here of Quincy. Remember this? This was back a couple of summers ago, I believe it was from June of 2021. Quincy on explaining how big XRP can get, where the price could realistically go. If you guys haven't seen this clip, take a look at this. Too. So one thing I definitely wanted to say this too on your channel, I want this to echo through the XRP community because it will excite people, but at the same time sort of make them go, what? <laughs> so anybody out there that's telling you they'll know where the price of XRP will go has no idea. Zero, zero, absolutely zero clue. But I'll give you a tiny hint of an idea of what could happen. So XRP is only, it's a financial instrument of value. And that instrument is basically, the instrument's really liquidity between different other instruments like bonds, stocks, currencies, all the, the everything basically. Yeah. And the XRP is only worth the value of the things that are issued on it because it would cost XRP to buy those things on the network and use that liquidity. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening here is not only do you have to issue all of the equity, but you've also got to issue all of the debt. So XRP is only bound by the fiscal uh, responsibility of the people that issue assets on it, which is obviously irresponsible. So XRP could be at $100, $100,000, $1,000,000. It depends on how many assets you want to issue onto the network. I'm going to stop it there for a second. So he's basically saying XRP will only be worth what is issued on the network. Assets, debts, everything. Okay, and look at how much we are in debt right now, just to kind of put it into perspective. Going back to earlier in the video, G20 finance ministers meeting, calling for suspending debt payments because they're so out of hand. So if you wanted to issue, you know, $100 trillion worth of uh, equity, cool. That's a lot of money on the network. What happens if they want to issue another $500 million worth of debt? That also adds value to the network. I'm just going to do a little bit of math here as Quincy's talking. So he said $100 trillion of equity. It's $100 million, billion, trillion. And then he said, what, another $500 million of debt plus $500 million of debt. Okay. So there really is a mind-blowing amount of wealth, essentially, that can basically be flowing through these networks that we can't even comprehend because of that debt question of being able to issue more and more and more value uh, in the form of debt and being able to leverage that. So essentially what he's saying is the possibilities are endless, but even if we just take these two random figures that he uh, decided, and this isn't terribly outlandish, what we get is $100 trillion, $500 million. Divide that by the current supply of XRP at $100 billion 
XRP, million, billion, and even at that, you got an XRP worth about $1,000. $1,000 and one cent, if we want to round up. So then the question is, how much debt are countries creating? How big is this going to get? And is Larry Fink's prediction or projection from March on track as this war heats up? Well, we know their whole goal is to great reset us. And, uh, you know, inflation has just been going up. It has not been tamed. That's just my opinion, but I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.